Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spearfish United Methodist Church's online worship. We're so happy that you can join us online, but we would love to have you join us in person on Saturday nights at 5.30 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. We are in a transitional period for our church between pastors. And in these few weeks, we will have different voices giving us messages of hope and peace and possibility. This week, we have the associate pastor from Canyon Lake in Rapid City, Stephanie Eliason, who will be telling us about our universe of possibilities and how it will affect us in our transition time and beyond. So I hope this is edifying to your spirit, and let's worship. Our first scripture is 1 Samuel 8, verses 4 through 20. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me, and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us, and to go out before us and fight our battles. Let's pray. Sensitive God, as you hid your face from those who went before, knowing that we cannot grasp the full measure of your glory, thank you that so often in the quiet, hidden places, You make your treasures known, teaching patient openness and revealing depths of meaning and compassion or heights of possibility and hope. For treasures hidden in the gentle smile or kindly act, thank you. For courageous care and generosity of spirit, thank you. For persistent justice-seeking and moments of reconciliation, Thank you for all that illuminates the darkness in our own and others' lives. Thank you. Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, enable us to see and share your treasure, guiding and upholding into love and life for all. Amen. Our New Testament scripture comes from 2 Corinthians 4, verses 13 all the way through chapter 5, verse 1. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, 
because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I will admit to you I'm not used to using a clicker, so we're going to see how this goes. Uh, as a, I was introduced, I'm Pastor Stephanie Eliason. I currently am the Associate Pastor at Canyon Lake in Rapid City with Scott McCurdy. I greatly enjoy it. I've been out in this area for two years now uh, and am always active because I have two small children and a husband and two dogs. Our house never stops moving. I am really excited to get to be here with you today. I was very thankful to be asked. I know you are in a time of transition and I am very hopeful for the time that will come for you as Paul and his family settle in and get to know each of you and to do ministry with you. All right, I'm going to say something that's radical, and you're going to then laugh. We live in a world. Yes, very radical, and I saw one giggle. That was good. Okay, but you're going to notice I said a world, not the world. Maybe I just need to hold it right there. <laughs> we don't, I'm not talking about our planet that we live on. I'm talking about the world that is created on this planet that we call home. This world is created by countries and philosophies, by relationships between people and things, by religions, and so many more things. Everything comes together, it, it meshes and blends, and it interacts to create the world we live in. So what kind of world do we live in? This is the question that I would like to look at first. So, think about your world. The experiences that have built you. The relationships that you have grown or maybe lost over time. Maybe it's between people or with objects or institutions. Now I want you to go back to the beginning. Think about when you were in school. Maybe you're thinking about elementary school, secondary school, college, or beyond. How was your readiness for the next step decided? I don't know if you guys are comfortable with this, but this is audience interaction tonight. So, how was your readiness for the next step decided? Any thoughts? I heard something was said. The end of the year? What happens at the end of the year? How do you know if you're going to go on? Tests. Lots of tests. What do you get on the top of a test when it comes back to you? A grade. And then the grade comes home on something that your parents will read? Report cards. And you might end up going to a parent-teacher conference <laughs> because of your report card. No, I never had that happen. Never. Grades, tests, report cards. Some of us are very familiar with this newfangled standardized test that now my children have to go through and the percentiles that we see based on that. Where do you fall in the rankings of all the other kids your age? All right, now what about at your work? Do you ever have performance reviews? Maybe depending on the field of work that you are or were in, you still had to take a few tests to prove you actually knew what you were doing. 
There were expectations of what you would do each day. Your productivity might have been monitored, maybe even compared to others. In both of these examples and in a lot of other ways in our world, assessments, scales, standards, and comparisons are everywhere. And they're all ways of measuring. Our world is a world of measurement. All right, now this next sentence doesn't really matter now. It's going to matter later. So remember that the next sentence is, what does this world of measurement look like? Our world, this world of measurement, this world that we live in, uses differences between people, between things, between structures and institutions as a means to decide how those differences make something better or worse than another. Back with the school example, the differences in your grades I shouldn't have looked up right in the middle of a sentence, sorry. The differences in your grades compared to another stu student showed who had learned the material better or worse. Then, of course, there's examples from our history and still from today. There have been times and there are still places where people will take the color of one person's skin compared to another to decide who is better, and who is worse. One version of a difference is better, and one is worse. And we can find examples of this again and again around the world, here in our immediate world, in the past, and still today. One group, one idea, one place is better than another, given more power or placed above others in a hierarchy. In the world of measurement, these differences, instead of being celebrated and valued, are used to sometimes create fear of what is other, whether it's people, things, or ideas. And those differences are then used to create competition between those people, things, or ideas. In the world of measurement, the isms are alive and well. Because what is racism, ageism, or sexism but a comparison of what is better and what is worse? But we don't do that. We don't participate in those. Or do we? See, the world of measurement is sneaky. I'm not saying that we participate in all of those isms. But the world of measurement is everywhere. We don't just compare skin or age or gender. We compare everything. It's the norm. It's practically indoctrinated into us from the time we are born, and we don't even realize it. Because you know what they say about children. They're like a sponge. They take in everything they hear or see, and especially the things you would rather them not hear or see. Any parent knows you have had that time where your child has said a word you did not teach them. It happened in the car on the way to daycare one day. Thankfully, it was phrased as, can I say this word? No, no, you may not. Children soak things in. We soaked things in. We grow up in systems that perpetuate this world of measurement with hierarchies and comparisons and fears. We live and interact in the world of measurement, and we compare ourselves to others. We compare our group to others, and we try to see who is better, who is worse. We give more power to some, and we take power from others in ways we don't even recognize. If I let it just sit right there, can you guys still hear me? Okay, I'll stop messing with it now. <laughs> 
We strive to get ourselves higher up a ladder, to try and gain more power or more resources than others, to live up to some measurement of what is better, what is successful. And this is where the Israelites were. 1 Samuel chap, uh, chapter 8, verses 4 and 5 say, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like the other nations. They looked around themselves and they saw differences between themselves and others. And they used those differences to make judgments of what was better. And then they grew afraid. Those nations looked stronger, bigger. Those nations had kings. Those nations could be a threat to them and their chance at survival and success. So they wanted what the others had. They wanted what they thought would bring them the success the others had, that would bring them power over the other nations, or maybe even strike fear into the other nations' hearts instead of theirs. But in their fear, as they compared themselves to those around them, they forgot that what they sought was already theirs. Chapter 7 says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. God already was their king. God was their protector. God wanted them to follow and listen to God's instructions because doing so would bring them success. But they instead wanted to get their success the way everyone else had. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we also may be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Up until this point in the Bible, we've actually heard these words time and time again. If you can think back to the last time you sat down and read Judges, I'm sure you did it last week, Tuesday probably. It's the day to read Judges. In the book of Judges, time and time again, the Israelites fall. They fail to listen, and then they come back to God and ask, God, please help us. And time and time again, we see God go out before them. And God fight their battles. And God provide governance for them. In their comparing, in their reaching and striving for success, for more, to be like others, to be better than others when measured, they had forgotten they already had it. And when we live in this world of measurement, we can be blinded to this fact in our own lives as well. So what's the alternative? What other way of living, thinking, speaking, and understanding is there? The alternative comes in many names, but one name can be the universe of possibility. World of measurement, universe of possibility. One sounds a bit bigger. In fact, universe tends to imply no edges. A universe can go on forever. We don't see the borders. Now here's the difference in what I'm going to say. I said, remember that I asked, what does the world of measurement look like? I'm not going to ask, what does the universe of possibility look like? I want to ask, what can it look like? Yes, the universe of possibility does exist. There are people living in it. Some of you do. Some of you are starting to. Some of you have for quite a long time. 
but I want to say what can it look like because I want to paint a picture that we won't see until it is fully realized in God's new creation. So what can it look like? It can look like a city that has high walls, but they were never built for protection. They were built for beauty. It can look like that same city with those walls, and in the walls are gates, but they are never, ever closed because there is no fear of what might enter through them. It can look like a place where there is enough for everyone, where resources are not hoarded by the powerful or the well-placed, but are equally accessible to all. It can look like health and healing available to everyone, no matter your supposed status, because none are viewed as lesser and all are seen as valuable and worthy. These images come from Revelation chapter 21. The ultimate universe of possibility is in God's presence within the new creation, where it will be relationships that are seen, not things compared. And it would be easy to say, okay, well, we'll get there when we die, so we don't need to worry about that now. It'll, it'll just happen then. But we do need to focus on it. All right, but what can I do? We can't go up against a vast system. I'm just one person. Change in me changes nothing. Stepping into the universe of possibility is hard, sometimes very hard. Unlike the world of measurement that seems to simply exist as part of our very beings, the universe of possibility has to be taught and encouraged, sought after, and intentionally and purposefully practiced. It won't be easy. It won't always be accepted by others because it is countercultural. It is counter to what we are told is just the way things are. I'm sure we've all heard that statement a time or two. Stepping into the universe of possibility is hard. But then Jesus warned us that it would be. Because we are called into this by Jesus. Another name for the universe of possibility, following Christ. Jesus lived in the universe of possibility and taught us how to do so as well. So we live in the world of measurement, but we are called to step into this universe of possibility. How? How do we do this incredibly hard thing? Well, what didn't the Israelites do in our Samuel reading today? They didn't listen and follow their God. Listen and follow. A great way to step into and to make sure you continue to grow in the universe of possibility is by listening to God in Jesus and following in his footsteps. Everywhere Jesus went, he saw people, really saw them. And many of them had been given labels. Sinner. Leper. Unclean prostitute, cheat. These labels were given by people who lived in the world of measurement and wanted to feel powerful, successful. And they did so by placing themselves above others. Jesus saw past the labels, and Jesus saw the person. Then, Jesus invited them into relationship with him, 
real relationships, where conversations aren't about trying to one-up the other or tell the better fish story, or to prove how you are more successful, but relationships where instead life is walked through together in compassion, not comparison, where love is shared instead of fear fostered. All right, I can't for sure say this, but I have a pretty good idea that most of you are Methodists. And as Methodists, you probably are familiar with a particular three simple rules. I see a few heads. Don't worry if you don't, I'll say them. It strikes me that those who follow Jesus, those who walk in this universe of possibility, will find themselves following three simple rules. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. When we live in possibility, focusing on relationships, we will do no harm by avoiding harmful comparisons, avoiding the excessive grab for resources that our world says is just necessary, and avoiding creating hierarchies that pit us against others, that harm, demean, and disenfranchise others. When we live in possibility, we will do good by speaking life and abundance, not only into our own lives, but into the lives of others. By finding joy, passion, and compassion at every turn, and seeing the value, worth, and possibilities that each person carries. When we live in possibility, we will stay in love with God by realizing our relationships with others and the world are better when our relationship with God is constantly growing, blooming, and bringing life into us. By living in a universe of possibility, by showing others the wonders of it, by expanding it, stepping outside of the bounds that we are taught to see, we will be working toward a world that can live in possibility. A world that someday will live in abundance for all, will value and treasure the uniqueness and importance of everyone, and will experience true joy, wholeness, compassion, and awe as we turn our sight from the things that won't last, that fade and go away, and reach for what is eternal and possible in God's world. So this week, I have a question that I would love for you to hold in the back of your mind. It's not an easy one. As you go through your week, I would encourage you to ask yourself, how are my thoughts, words, and actions a reflection of the world of measurement? And you will find ways to answer that. So will I. Some of the answers are going to be overt, clear, and out in the open, and some are going to be subtle. They've been ingrained into us our whole lives. And that's okay. But once you ask the question, once you start to seek and find those answers, then you can ask, all right, now how do I change? How do I tweak and reinvent my thoughts, words, and actions to do no harm, to do good, to stay in love with God, and live in the universe of possibility? Because we live in a world of measurement, but we are called to step outside the box, to reinvent our world, and live into the universe of possibility. But it's our choice. So which one will we live in? Would you pray with me, please? Holy God, we know that we are called by you to live into what is possible through your love in this world. And we know that it's not easy. 
We ask your presence, your strength, your love to fill us. We ask you would open our eyes to recognize when we do compare, when we do support the systems that hurt, even when we really don't understand how we could have done that. Lord God, don't just open our eyes to this, but open our hearts to find the ways that we can change, not only ourselves, but those around us and eventually our world, so that we can all live in relationships of compassion, not comparison, and of love, not fear. Lord God, show us your way. Help us to do no harm, to do good, and to stay in love with you always. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive this benediction. Bless us, God, as we step out into this universe of possibilities. Help us to take your passion with us, fan its flame today, and after that, remind us of your everlasting love. Please help us keep our eyes on you as we witness the plans for this universe unfold. Amen. (laughs) 